Hello everyone, here we are, module four, and we are moving to the 1960s. We're gonna be looking at a very cool film from a very cool movement. The name of our film is Breathless. So again, like I said, Breathless is from a very fun movement. Um, it's a fun cinematic movement um, called the French New Wave, which I think will hit that, that name again in a few minutes. Um, this whole movement is based upon the idea of kind of trying to break the rules and change up the game when it comes to cinema and how to tell stories. Um, they do a lot when it comes to editing to kind of change the game of cinema. Um, and editing in general is a function that's unique to cinema, right? When you're talking about any other kind of visual art, whether it be painting or drawing or photography or anything like that, um, it, it's just the single image, whatever it is, and it gets put on a wall or whatever. Um, again, we're talking about sculpting, any of that. Um, but with cinema, we get to edit the images side by side to create connections and um, create context that necessarily isn't even there um, in each individual image. But by putting two images together, we create new context and new ideas. And so again, that's very unique to cinema in general. So again, the French New Wave um, was a movement that um, took place between like 1958 and about the mid to late 60s. So it was a pretty short movement. Um, this film we're looking at, Breathless, is a French film um, that was made in 1960, so it's pretty early on in the French New Wave movement. Um, and again, this whole idea of the French New Wave, where it came from, was, was actually started by a bunch of film critics in France who thought that they could do a better job making movies than the filmmakers who were doing the job already, right? So at the time, in France, they were making a lot of big budget, big money, kind of cinematic, epic type films that were, uh, many of them were actually adaptations of novels. And it was kind of, they were just kind of um, copy and pasting, you know, one novel for another novel for another novel and just kind of doing these remakes of novels. There wasn't very much creativity. No one was writing new material. Um, it was just trying to make it so that um, it was all safe bet stuff, right? These films, they knew they were going to make them and they were going to make a lot of money and no one was really taking chances and experimenting and trying to move the art of cinema forward. So... That's where the French New Wave came in. And the idea, there's this little phrase down below that says, the camera as pen. That whole idea, again, was um, first came up with by um, a critic who wrote a big article. And it talked about how cinema is becoming an art form very similar to painting or the novel, where it's a way to express ideas and feelings and emotions. And it's kind of coming into its own. But current filmmakers weren't actually utilizing it that way. They were just doing this cookie cutter, copy and paste kind of method of just reproducing work that they knew was um, money making, but wasn't very um, creative, right? And so these guys got together and decided that they were gonna do something different. Now this particular film is directed by a guy named um, Jean-Luc Godard, who is definitely an auteur director and so what an auteur director is, it goes back to that idea that the camera as pen, meaning that the director has the major creative influence on the piece, kind of like a writer to a novel, right? The writer to the novel, they are the only artist that has influence into the story because they're the ones writing the words down on the page, right? Well, um, these guys, many of these film directors, again, Jean-Luc Godard being one of them, they went along the premise that I'm going to decide everything that I see in front of the lens, right? I'm going to have people help me. I'm going to have collaborators, but ultimately it's my vision, my voice, my idea, my expression that's going to end up on the screen. And that's what an auteur director is, right? So that's what auteur theory is. Um, and again, Jean-Luc Godard is definitely one of them. Um, this is a crime drama. The film Breathless is a crime drama, um, which is a little bit different than, again, the kind of films that were being made in France at the time. 
So again, the French New Wave, attempting to redefine the language of film by using a variety of techniques in the same film. Still photography, freeze frames, wipes, pans, jump cuts, um, and have a lot of movement and energy within each frame. That is kind of the stylistic approach of the French New Wave. So back then, and even now, currently, we don't see a lot of freeze frames being used in um, modern cinema. Um, we don't see a lot of still photography being employed in motion picture cinema. Um, we do see different transitions like wipes and things like that. Back then, panning and tilting wasn't a big thing. Um, and definitely the jump cut is being used a lot more frequently today. But back in the 1960s, this was kind of the invention of the jump cut. And the jump cut is just an idea of cutting two shots together that don't necessarily match or have a nice cohesive um, blending to the point where they get cut. It's really jarring um, and really stands out when you make a jump cut, okay? Um, and then again, having a lot of movement and energy within the frame is something that we see a lot now, especially in action movies. But again, back then, it wasn't that way um, when they were making their movies. And you can see there's a picture of uh, Jean-Luc Godard with one of the cameras he was using. Um, the French were making a lot of very small, compact cameras that these filmmakers used. So they were making a camera called the Eclair. Um, there's another one called the Bolex. These were some cameras that were pretty small. That um, an Aton is another French camera that was pretty small. And these cameras were coming out and they were, it allowed these filmmakers to do really creative, um, freeing type cinema because the camera was so tiny and could, could move around freely. Um, they definitely looked for authentic contemporary stories. So they weren't looking to old novels of old historic um, um, literature to find their stories. They were finding modern stories that were contemporary, that made a statement about what was going on in the political um, realm of the world or what was going on in society at the time. Um, they definitely wanted to raise questions and they definitely did not answer all the questions in a movie, right? So a lot of times you'll feel like you got the short end of a stick if you watched a film and it posed some questions and you didn't actually get those questions answered. Well, that happens often in the French New Wave um, and you don't necessarily get the answers to everything that gets introduced to you along the way. Um, they tried to make it feel more like a documentary than a big budget movie. So they wanted these films to feel real and edgy um, and not have that big polish kind of um, a big studio feel to the French New Wave projects. This film follows a, a dangerous criminal by the, by the name of Michel who is, um, or Michelle, sorry, who is on the run from the police. So that's kind of, it's kind of this crime drama and we're following this character. Um, and when he goes to the big city, he finds love with an American whose name is Patricia. Um, and Godard wanted this, again, he wanted this film to feel like a documentary, like we were watching real life. Like we were watching a real life crime drama play out in front of us, in front of the camera. So this definitely, um, um, is definitely in line with the French New Wave and the style of filmmaking that they were trying to do at the time. They definitely film with a handheld camera in many of the scenes. So they're not using big fancy cranes and dollies to get their shots. Um, they use very little lighting if they use any at all. Um, there's a hotel scene that was shot. Um, it's a big conversation between the two characters, I believe. Um, and it's shot with no film lighting whatsoever. It's just using the available light, the lighting that's in the room, to um, um, to illuminate the scene, which is pretty unique. That they usually they're we're adding um, we're adding motion picture lighting to the scenario. Okay, um, the film was shot on thirty five millimeter um, still film, um, spliced together because it wasn't motion picture film sensitive enough at the time. Okay, so. What that means is there back then in 1960, there wasn't motion picture film stock that could shoot in available light inside like that. It just wasn't a possibility. So they went to a still film, which there was a brand called Ilford. I think Ilford is still around. It's black and white film. Um, the fastest at the time was 400 ASA, which was the most sensitive you could get at the time, which isn't very sensitive today. And so they kind of 
glued that or taped that film together to get a roll of film big enough to shoot a scene. And then they put it in the camera and shot on that film. And that's how they were able to do a film in available light indoors at the time. Okay. Um, tracking shots were filmed on wheelchairs. So again, they didn't have big fancy equipment. They were just putting somebody on a wheelchair and kind of rolling them down the sidewalk or down a hallway. And that's what they were using to get some of these shots. And because the camera was so small, they were able to do that kind of stuff. Um, this particular film was shot chronologically all except for the opening sequence. So the whole rest of the movie is shot chronologically, which is very different than traditional cinema. Traditional cinema, we shoot completely out of order. Um, we'll shoot the last scene on day one, and then, like, again, it just bounces around all over the place because it's all about the schedule <clears throat> and timing and availability of actors and locations and things like that. Um, we're completely shooting out of, out of order all the time. In fact, I've never worked on a film ever where we shot it chronologically. Um, but Godard felt that for the storyline and the narrative and the character arc, that it was going to be a better process to let the characters play this out in real time in chronological order. Um, and that was going to be better for the movie so they could keep it all straight in this kind of documentary style. So that was pretty unique for cinema shooting chronologically. 